Uh, so without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's speaker. Tonight's speaker is Dale Norwood. He's a historian of 19th century America who studies global commerce and how it has shaped American politics and economics, both domestically and in US foreign relations. Uh, so this will really be an opportunity for us to hear more about right, global early America and how things were connected long before we got to the globalized world that we're in today. Uh, Dr. Norwood earned his PhD at Princeton in 2012 and is now an assistant professor in the Department of History at the University of Delaware. And with that, I will hand it over to him. Um, oh, and there's a cell phone here. Well, thanks so much for the kind introduction. Thank you all for coming out and uh, go Phillies, of course. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I particularly wanna thank uh, Mabel uh, Rosen Heck and Emily Miller for making arrangements for this event um, and the crew here for uh, filming and, and making that possible. And to uh, offer some thanks to Stephanie Townrow who uh, first extended the invitation. I'm really glad to be here. Lancaster is a great place. And I'm delighted to speak with you today about uh, my new book, uh, Trading Freedom, How Trade with China Defined Early America. Um, so for this talk, I want to do a couple of things. <laughs> I like the enthusiastic applause. <laughs> so uh, I want to do a couple of things uh, to earn that applause uh, uh, later. Uh, I want to tell you how I came to this project, because it's a bit weird to spend a decade of your life studying um, New England opium traders and then come and talking about it uh, in other places. Um, <clears throat> I want to give you an overview and a synopsis of the book, not to forestall you from buying it, but to see what you might get if you do. No, I give you some of the big takeaways. Um, and I want to get into the meat of what I think is interesting, or one of the things that I think is interesting about studying this history, and that is drugs and money and how the two are connected and how they influenced America, something that I'm sure is, uh, that I think is relevant uh, to us today. And I want to kind of wrap up with what I think some of the big takeaways of, of doing this kind of history is for how we should view the past and, and possibly understand the present. So, so that's the roadmap for today. Um, the short version of how I got into this project was that I had a chance backroom encounter with a drug smuggler in a sleepy Connecticut town, and that that became a useful mystery for me that I, I really couldn't let it alone. And that's a semi-salacious uh, way of saying that I first heard about the China trade when I was a college student and I was working at a local historical society, one much less impressive than this one, though I enjoyed it nonetheless, um, in whoop, Middletown, Connecticut. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, thank you. Um, let's see if I... Can, yeah, great. Okay. Uh, in Middletown, Connecticut. And one of my jobs there was to process the personal papers of local notables, including a man by the name of Samuel Russell, who was an antebellum bigwig who built an impressive Greek revival mansion on the hill at the center of town, and it's now part of the, uh, of the campus of Wesleyan University. Now, a big rich guy building a big house is not really all that interesting or new, but um, the source of Russell's wealth was before retiring to Middletown, Connecticut, a city I should note that is not on the coast, um, he made his money smuggling opium from India into China and then using the profits to buy tea to ship from China to the US and to Europe. And in fact, Russell wasn't just one man in this business. He was the co-founder of Russell and Company, the largest American firm operating in Asia over the course of the entire 19th century. So the incongruous fact of Samuel Russell's narco empire um, and its result in Middletown, Connecticut, which again is a very nice building, um, uh, stuck with me <laughs> after I left that job was my kind of cocktail party conversation. But it didn't become a useful puzzle for me until later when I started a PhD in American history and needed something to write about. And so reading through the scholarship on early America, I noticed something. And that was that up until about the revolutionary era, um, stories about how Americans were connected to the rest of the world, how they were engaged in global affairs, uh, were front and center in both the, you know, scholarship, but also in some of our public stories. Um, but then after you get past the revolution, those angles drop out, or did when I started this project. And the rest of the world seems to vanish. We pay attention to Kansas and Iowa and other very interesting places um, until the early 20th century when world wars bring the rest of the world roaring back in, or maybe the Spanish-American War, if, you're, if you want to start there. And that seemed fishy to me, because I knew a guy ran a giant smuggling empire in between those two things, and I wanted to figure out what was actually going on there. Did Americans really take a century off from interacting with the rest of the world? Did events in Iowa or Illinois really overshadow all of those connections? And, and what about Samuel Russell's opium operation? How did that fit into American history? And especially how did it fit into other areas of American history that we, we know got kind of messy, Chinese exclusion, 
uh, Chinese migration, that kind of thing. So that's what led me to write this book. Um, and those are some of the questions that got me digging into this material. And what I found surprised me, and I hope will surprise you as well. Um, first and most notably, I learned in doing this research that far from being an outlier or a weirdo, Samuel Russell, well, he might have been a weirdo. I don't want to go that far. Um, Samuel Russell and his associates were part of a very large and a very old and very profitable business, something that contemporaries called the China trade. And the China trade, briefly put, was the maritime shipping business of purchasing, carrying, and marketing the goods of Asia in the Western world and vice versa, right? So making, uh, uh, importing stuff from Asia, exporting stuff to Asia. And the second thing I learned was not only was this trade large, old, and profitable, but it was also much, much more than a simple bilateral exchange. In fact, I think the China trade was America's key to the global economy. And now that's partly a matter of size and scale, right? In the late 18th and the early 19th century, the U.S. is small, peripheral, not a big power, right? It's not the continental empire or leading economy. But in that same period, China was big. As it is now, China was then China, Asia's greatest economy and its most important empire. China produced things desired globally, many of which that you could only get in China. Tea, silk, porcelains, and as a result, Chinese ports like Canton, Guangzhou, were global crossroads. So by going to China, traders from the United States, the small peripheral in the United States, could gain access to goods that would sell well anywhere in the world. So it opened a lot of doors for them. But, you know, as anyone who's ever been to a fancy department store or an auto dealership where you can't afford the things on display, getting to the valuable stuff is only half the story. You also have to have a means for paying for it. So Americans had to figure out how to pay for stuff in China. And that proved a, a pretty difficult problem for them. In the 18th and early 19th centuries, there was little to no demand for agriculture, American agricultural or uh, manufactured goods in China or really anywhere in Asia. And so Americans couldn't trade with goods from home. They had to either find cash, they had to get credit, or they had to find goods that the Chinese did want elsewhere and then bring those to China. So that meant that they had to do a lot more legwork, and it expands our definition of what the China trade is. The China trade includes the whole chain of enabling transactions that made purchases in Asia possible too, not just the back and forth. And that chain had many, many links. In the first decade of the China trade, American merchants from ports up and down the, west, uh, the East Coast um, had to sail the world over to gather the coin and the rare commodities required for purchases in China. They traded at European and South American ports for Spanish silver dollars, the, always, the only always accepted currency in international trade, but particularly in Chinese ports. But they also gathered ginseng from Appalachian forests. They hunted sea otters and other cute things in the Pacific Northwest for furs. They stopped at Hawaii for sandalwood, bird's nests, and beche de mer, sea slugs. The latter is something you eat, not a pet. Um, and in the early 1800s, they found a profitable new avenue when they began visiting the Mediterranean ports of the Ottoman Empire and the British-controlled ports in India for opium. Right? So they had to go lots of different places. And as the trade developed, carrying Chinese goods expanded also into carrying Chinese people. U.S. ships tra transported Chinese migrants to North and South America, to the Caribbean, and to Australia, among other places. None of these segments worked independently from each other. They were all inter uh, intertwined. And the way that they were intertwined changed over time. Beginning uh, in the early decades of the trade, uh, uh, merchants made multiple stops. These individual voyages turned into years-long venture, not because things were necessarily just far away, but because you had to stop at multiple places to gather the cargoes that you needed. Later, American merchants built multi-ship and multi-year ventures, um, complex circuits of exchange that ran from Boston to Batavia, from London to Lima, from Shanghai to San Francisco, and everywhere in between. As often as not, Americans' business with China never touched U.S. shores, which if you're trying to be in the business of figuring out how big it was, is a bit of a problem. So this business is big. It's on a global scale from really the beginning, um, and it's a little out of view. And third, and perhaps most importantly, I learned that this trade was not independent of politics, either domestic or international. The China trade depended as much on the navigation of credit networks and diplomatic protocols as it did on the management of ships and sail. It also produced a new kind of politics, or rather new kinds of politics, plural. The China trade put American merchants and sailors into direct contact with a vast array of new peoples and places. And at critical moments, the existence of the trade and the outcome and the, 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 the money it made and the products it supplied inspired policymakers and politicians and sometimes American publics 
to consider national products and domestic disputes in global terms. So because of the extent of the goods, capital, and people it involved, trade with China profoundly shaped Americans' perceptions of themselves, of their government, and their nation's place in the world, and they helped define and shape how their nation developed from its earliest days. So trading freedom narrates this development chronologically. I'm a historian, go in order of the years. Um, and I begin with the first American trading voyage to China, which leaves New York Harbor for Canton in 1784. And the book draws to a close a century later with the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1884, which hap happens to have coincided with the death of major trading, uh, major US China merchant firms in the 1880s and 1890s. In other words, the book tracks the beginnings of the, uh, uh, the China trade from its origins to its end. And in the course of that century, free commerce with China shifted into something Americans embraced as part of their national project to something that they feared uh, uh, that would damage their national project. Right? So in the early years, the China trade is something that American publics and policymakers sought to promote and expand. And by the end of the 19th century, it's something they feared would uh, destroy what they had built and they sought to control and restrict it. And that conceptual shift from understanding U.S.-China commercial relations as a mode of accessing a wider global system of, uh, system of global commerce that would benefit the nation, um, I call it in the book, the China trade mindset, um, to figuring trade with China is something that can be broken down into discrete sources of either new consumers, new laborers, or new commodities that had to be separated in order to, to be remain safe. I call that the China market mode of thought. And we are still living in the consequences of that shift of China as something that uh, uh, policymakers want to control and regulate that commerce, as opposed to the century where um, embracing it in the widest possible means was core to Americans' understanding of themselves. Now, within that wider arc, that's the big picture, each chapter of the book focuses on specific characters, institutions, and incidents that did that I think did the most to establish or change the politics or the meaning of U.S.-China commercial relations. And so today I'm going to talk mainly about one of those stories, the rise and consequences of Americans' engagement in the opium trade, but other chapters of the book detail topics like how the revolutionary generation's utopian hopes for global commerce led them to set up the first US tax system to privilege trade with China, free trade with China, um, or how the China trade directly inspired the transcontinental railroad, um, or how antebellum slaveholders and their Northern allies like James Buchanan, happy to say more about him, um, how antebellum slaveholders successfully defined free Chinese migrants as enslaved people, paving the way for our contemporary immigration system that excludes certain people on the basis of their national origins. That's something with antebellum origins in the politics of slavery. So collectively, the book's chapters are an argument for taking the early history of U.S.-China relations seriously as a foundation for our present, but also as evidence of how global and how globalized uh, the U.S. was already in the past. And so with that in mind, I want to get into the nitty gritty of one of these episodes, the rise of the opium trade, and some of its key characters and some of the key documents I used to investigate and tell that story. Um, and befitting a book that has a boat on the cover, this, this story begins in the hold of a ship. This is not literally the hold of the ship. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, when the ship Congress sailed from Boston Harbor, bound for the Dutch colonial port of Batavia, today's Jakarta, in 1824, it went with a bundle of receipts, invoices, and correspondence. And these documents are collectively known as ship's papers. And they make up sort of a floating business archive. It's the working papers of, of the venture as a, as a business. And they give us a great snapshot in this particular case of where American trade with China had been in terms of how it was practiced and where it was going at a very critical moment. So on the more traditional side of the ledger, Jacob Caswell and Benjamin, Benjamin Britnall entrusted 100 Spanish milled dollars, Spanish silver co coins, to an agent on board the ship who promised to carry and invest it from port to port. And that practice of loading some capital and trusting your agent to invest it in a cargo and flip those cargoes and flip those cargoes and flip those cargoes is known as a cabotage strategy. You're moving from port to port. And um, it's traditional in the American China trade from the beginning of the revolution on through into the 1820s. Um, it's designed to make the most out of limited resources, right? You're trying to turn your capital over and make good bets. And it's characteristic of American trade with China um, since the revolution. Also on board the Congress, though, <clears throat> Um, is William Gray's cargo. Now, William Gray, the Congress's owner, ship owner, adopted a more sophisticated approach in terms of what he put on board. 
A wealthy merchant whose obituary claimed that there was not a commercial place in the civilized world where his name was not familiar. Gray was a fixture of Boston's mercantile elite and a player in state politics. In his prime, he owned and managed one of the nation's largest commercial fleets. And in his later years, he was instrumental in organizing and leading the Boston branch of the Bank of the United States. We'll come back to that later. Now, Gray used the knowledge his vast financial and commercial relationships provided to guide his investments in the Congress. He packed the hold with nearly $8,000 of what I'm terming here Western commodities, uh, candles, beef, flour, seltzer water, anything that would make for an exciting weekend at any colonial port across the globe and readily saleable as such. Um, he also invested nearly $20,000 in opium, a smokable narcotic with a large and growing market in Southeast Asia and especially China's Southern ports. Gray also gave the captain of the ship, Nathaniel Kinsman, access to up to, up to $50,000 in credit with his London bankers at Bering Brothers and Company, so that Kinsman might take advantage of good prices for return cargoes of Asian products as he encountered them, right? So time the market as he was there. That could be, and in his, in his instruction letter to Kinsman, he identifies things like teas at Guangzhou or sugars at Manila or cottons at Calcutta. There's a lot of different kinds of products that he could buy. And that credit was to be drawn on via bills of exchange, which Kinsman most likely carried as a packet of pre-printed forms. And I'll show you an example of this kind of thing um, in a minute, but a bill of exchange effectively is a credit instrument that works like a check, right? You could sign it over to other people. It shows that you're drawing on a particular account or at a particular bank, right? Now, Gray's choices took advantage of the new system of global exchange that took shape after the Napoleonic Wars, after 1815. Before the decades of global warfare between Great Britain and France were decided at Waterloo, American merchants and the U.S. government had profited handsomely from their status as neutral shippers. And I say the government as well because the U.S. government, until the inst institution of the income tax, was mi mainly funded by tariffs. Um, U.S. shippers are the ones paying those tariffs. So if you have a good merchant marine, you also have good government revenues. But it's all dependent on international trade, which if two giant powers are at war, you can make a lot of money shipping between them, right? But the end of this conflict and the near disaster of the War of 1812, uh, which Amer in which Americans trade dragged them into this conflict, <clears throat> meant that these old strategies no longer worked. For merchants like Gray, that meant that shifting, uh, they had to shift their activities to support British imperialism in Asia rather than filling in its gaps. For politicians in Washington, that meant treating the once celebrated China trade as a problem for national security rather than as a solution. Now that shift was part of a broader reorientation for American politics, which I don't have a good image for, so I've gone to black screen here. <laughs> uh, abstract concepts are hard to, hard to illustrate. Um, after facing near annihilation in the second war with Great Britain in the War of 1812, US legislators came to see relying on trade as an engine for uh, national prosperity as well as government revenue as more dangerous than useful. So from the perspective of the National Republicans then ruling in Washington in the 1810s and 1820s, only active government intervention could strengthen the nation's domestic economy sufficiently to withstand or ideally avoid the next war. In this American system, in Henry Clay's phrase, um, it was designed to create the infrastructure necessary to make international trade unnecessary, right, both financial and physical. A side effect of this reorientation away from international trade and toward domestic development was that powerful Americans began to regard China traders as impediments to national prosperity. China traders became under particular scrutiny for their unique business practices. Annually, they shipped millions of dollars worth of silver coin to China. And that silver drain, which picked up in this period, attracted a great deal of interest from publicists and policymakers concerned that it was ruining the nation's currency and thereby threatening the republic's stability. So American merchants had shipped significant amounts of silver specie, silver coin, uh, Spanish silver coin, to Asia for decades. You can see them picking up in purple here on this, on this uh, 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 chart here. Um, the reason they were doing that is that Spanish minted dollars were the only always welcome commodity in Guangzhou's markets. And because of the United States considerable involvement in Latin American and Caribbean trade, i.e. places where Spanish silver dollars were made, as well as traded, US-based merchants usually had access to a ready supply, either from their own dealings or from US banks. Spanish dollars also held a special place in the American economy. They were legal tender. So you could use Spanish coins as you would uh, uh, American coinage, 
And they were a common medium for commercial transactions, particularly large ones, particularly international uh, transactions. And they functioned, and this is really critical for the money supply, they functioned as the reserve currency upon which banks issued banknotes. So they were deeply... Uh, uh, they were deeply important to stability of private banknotes because that's what was in the vaults that was guaranteeing those banknotes. And I could say I could say a lot more about American money. I will not bore you like I usually do my students when I segue into antebellum banking. But um, suffice to say that silver drain is concerning because it means that banks have less reserves, fewer reserves to draw on. That trend of Americans becoming um, major exporters of silver specie and accelerating also happens at a moment. Um, that uh, uh, the American economy hits a snag, hits a tailspin. You can see that it eventually drops off in the 1830s, but as it's ramping up, um, the U.S. undergoes a, a recession in the Panic of 1819. And many contemporaries connected the unprecedented flow of silver to Asia to the credit contractions, the bank runs, and the currency instability that were plagued the country in the aftermath of the Panic of 1819. The arch protectionist Niles Weekly Register, the closest thing that the, uh, the nation had to a national newspaper at this point, argued that traders to China who exported specie, silver coin, were destructive merchants whose business ought to be annihilated for the trouble that they caused. A, a later follow-up to that article in that same newspaper said that not only should they, we ruin these people's business and ban them from exporting silver, we should also take away the franchise. They should not be allowed to vote because they become such irresponsible citizens. It's a little hard to imagine taking anyone's businessman, any businessman's right to vote away today, but that's that's how head up people were about this. So the infamy of specie exportation proved a, a really stubborn stain. It really it really changes the public impression of the China trade for decades, but it also became a crucial component of the Bank of the United States President Nicholas Biddle's plan to domesticate and secure global flows of capital for Americans' benefit and his bank's profit. So Biddle. Uh, a Pennsylvanian, was elected to the presidency of the Second Bank of the United States in 1822. He's the new guard come to fix what this bank uh, had not done well during this previous um, economic crisis. The bank at this point is a controversial institution. It's the second because the first bank had been allowed to lapse. The, uh, it's got a federal, new federal charter. Biddle comes in to clean it up. It's the, it's the country's largest corporation, and it alone had the ability to conduct operations in all U.S. states, giving it extraordinary power and depending on who you talk to, extraordinary responsibility. By 1825, Biddle had noticed that each spring, China merchants made large annual calls on local banks in the Northeast for silver specie because they were outfitting their voyages to go out to China. The trouble was that these calls intensified the already significant challenge of, re uh, of retaining liquidity across the Bank of the United States' branches, but also banks that they helped serve, right? The Bank of the United States is kind of a bank for banks. It's a little bit like the Fed. It's not a central bank in the same way, but it is serving other banks. All these specie calls make their, his life much more difficult um, <clears throat> and makes the, the, the prospect of failing banks much more likely if there's a, if there's a credit crunch. So Biddle's idea to smooth out these disruptions these, that these annual flows of silver caused, in the spring of 1825, Biddle's bank began selling what he termed East India bills or East Indies bills. And these are bills of exchange, like the kind William Gray had, um, that were issued by the Bank of the United States to American merchants that drew on the bank's accounts with European banks. And I'll diagram this a little bit in this next thing here. Uh, the Bank of the United States East India bills were indistinguishable from other private bills already in use in the China trade. They're not inventing something new here, but they benefited from having the weight of the nation's largest financial institution behind them. And basically the way that this worked is that if you would go to the bank and say, hey, I'd like to um, buy some East India bills, they'd say, great, uh, we'll sell them to you for you know either cash now or a promise, uh, an IOU in the future. Um, you'd get these pre-printed forms that say, I, the Bank of the United States, allow so-and-so to draw on the Bank of the United States accounts in London. You could then use those bills to buy, make purchases in Asia. The person who you paid these to would then send the bills back to London where they would be cashed at those banks. So it's like a little bit like an American Express check used to work like for those folks who remember doing that. Um, so Biddle intended that the East India bills, uh, uh, he, he wanted them to do more than just help merchants move money, right? That's fun. But Biddle wanted to make his bank an intermediary in global finance capable of absorbing what he called the sudden and violent fluctuations of international trade. So the bank already works that way in the United States economy. He wants to position the bank between the rest of the world and the U.S. 
So East India bills provided the means to head off financial panics that could result when the spread in price and specie domestically uh, versus foreign markets widened sufficiently to induce the export of silver, right? If silver is higher priced abroad, you send it abroad, right? He's trying to head that off. He had the chance to test this method the same year that he debuted these bills in 1825, when a summer slump in cotton prices caused a wave of failures on both sides of the Atlantic and the Bank of England, an even bigger bank, to contract its credit, which led to a wave of failures in the British Empire that threatened to spread to the United States and increased specie calls on American banks, right? We want you to pay back your loans in hard money right now. To head off the disaster, Biddle worked the bank as what he called a balance wheel, selling coin and issuing notes to provide liquidity to other institutions and counter prevailing market forces. It worked so well, or he claimed it worked so well, that he later made that success a centerpiece of his defense against Andrew Jackson's attacks on the Bank of the United States. One of his supporters highlighted that success, crowing in a newspaper how Biddle's East India bills allowed the U.S. to, and I'm not going to shout here, but imagine gigantic all caps type here, allowed the U.S. to escape from the misfortunes which have overwhelmed the British Empire, which is a nice national boost for Americans as well. They get to overwhelm, beat the Brits. Um, in an irony, while Biddle intended his experiments to protect Americans from Britain's economic misfortunes, in China, they helped accelerate Americans' entanglement with British imperial schemes. And that's a consequence not just of what Biddle was doing, but how Americans uh, in the China trade reorganized following the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Um, okay. So I want to say a little bit about how this trade worked, just kind of generally before I tell you how it changed. In the first decades of the American-China trade, the business decisions for each voyage were managed by uh, an official known as a supercargo, who's a floating agent for the ship's investors and cargo owners who oversaw all transactions involving the cargo, not the sales and the management of the ship, but the cargo, um, in return for a share of the profits. It's very common for a merchant family to put the, you know, the smart nephew as the supercargo, and sometimes to put the dumb nephew, and then you don't get your return on your investment. But it's, it's that kind of, it's a, it's a principal agent problem management. As the business grew, more firms found that having a resident agent in Guangzhou provided an advantage. So people started to stay over and not just accompany single voyages, but work all year round. And they lived in the foreign quarter of Canton, of Guangzhou, which you can see pictured here in 1805. The way Chinese authorities have the China trade set up is that foreigners are restricted to a certain area outside of the city. You can see it's, it's a little bit of a suburb there. Um, down in the left-hand corner here, factories is what, you, what the neighborhood is called. It's outside the city walls. It's a way of quarantining them from um, access to the regular part of the city. But they rent these things called factories or hongs, which are a combination warehouse and living space. And most other uh, traders organized their, their ventures by uh, through a national company that have a, had a monopoly on the trade, the English East India Company, right? Um, Americans organized it as private ventures, but they still tended to live in the same place. And so that's why you see the flags above here. Most of that is indicating which company or which nationality, which for most people is the same thing, except for Americans who are doing this as private traders. Okay. So living in the segregated neighborhood um, designated by law for foreign traders year round, um, resident merchants developed a better knowledge of local conditions and cultivated closer relationships with Chinese business partners. Um, getting better prices on goods, higher prices on sales. You know, if you're buddies with your uh, uh, with the guys you're working with, you get you get sweeter deals. And that's that's the that's the the reason most American firms, particularly after the Napoleonic Wars, switch to having resident merchants. They all rely on resident merchants, and those resident merchants use the extra time they had in China to explore new lines of business. And no one wrung more from this system than John Perkins Cushing, who I don't unfortunately have a good portrait of, but imagine a guy named John Perkins Cushing. You can just picture him in your mind's eye. Whatever he looks like, that's what he looks like to you. Um, um, Cushing ran the Guangzhou outpost of Perkins & Company, a Boston-based merchant firm with representatives all over the world who coordinated interdependent circuits of trade in furs, silver, teas, and cotton goods. The China office was one of the most important of these locations. And during his nearly 30 years in China, he started there as a teenager. He retired in middle age. He complemented the, adva the advantage that his favorable position in this network with his own innovations. And specifically, he devised new ways of smuggling that flooded the Canton market with opium, revolutionizing the China trade. Yep. Okay. So the opium trafficking system Cushing put at the center of the Perkins business was a response to British colonial policy. 
In the late 18th century, the British East India Company noticed that there was a new market for smokable opium in Southeast Asia, and they began forcing Indian peasants to cultivate opium poppies to supply it. That's the opium poppy there in the, in the image. Opium provided the company with a new source of revenue and helped balance their uh, purchases of tea in China. But the East India Company had a problem in that the Qing dynasty had prohibited importations of opium, particularly smokable opium, since the 1730s, and it kept reiterating those bans. It was an illegal drug. It had always been an illegal drug as long as the British were importing it. Um, so the East India Company decided not to ship it in their own ships, but to sell it to third parties known as country traders, because they were trading between India and China, so still in the country of Asia, the country territory. And these private third parties moved the drug into China proper. Now, Americans' first experiments in importing opium into China used different methods at first. They were excluded from buying opium in India until 1813, um, when the East India Company's monopoly ceases in India. Um, so they instead turned to the Ottoman port of Smyrna, today's Izmir, for their supply. And that Turkey opium that Americans imported from the Anatolian coast was of lower quality than that produced in India, but still found a market. And by being the cheap alternative, helped expand the market for the narcotic, right? An addictive substance is, a, is something that you can rapidly expand the market on as long as it's cheap enough. When the British East India Company's monopoly on the Indian trade was withdrawn in 1813, during the middle of the War of 1812, during wartime, American resident merchants in, in China got directly into the business in India, and Cushing was a critical figure. Uh, using his firm's capital to float early American dealers in Indian opium, notably Samuel Russell of Russell and Company, who would later merge with Perkins's firm. Now, Cushing didn't just float loans to opium traders, he also helped them build a new smuggling system. Cushing knew from his years of residence that Chinese officials had a tight grip on Guangzhou's official port, Wampoa. Canton is really, Guangzhou is really up at the end of a long river delta. Wampoa is like the shipping zone. Um, there was a lot of policing there, but lower down in the Pearl River Delta was less tightly uh, controlled. So Cushing and other merchants set up a shadow port around a river island called Lin Tin, where they anchored warehouse ships to receive incoming opium and eventually lots of other kinds of smuggled goods. In Guangzhou proper, they sold chits to Chinese brokers who went to Lin Tin to pick up the opium before selling its uh, the end product to consumers. So they offloaded risk and stayed out of the view of Chinese authorities. And with this system in place, opium imports doubled, then tripled, and then nearly quadrupled in a decade. The boom cemented opium as the keystone commodity for the China trade, doing for the creation of modern capitalist market dynamics in Asia what tobacco and sugar had done for the Atlantic world. Opium imports increasingly replaced silver in Western merchants' exchanges for teas and silks in China. Or at least opium did so as a trade good. Um, I wouldn't recommend trying to use opium as money. It's viscous, it's bulky, it smells uh, quite uh, notably, it's easily recognized as contraband. So it doesn't serve as currency. Instead, credit instruments took the place of silver money in exchanges, mostly in the forms of bills of exchange drawn on London, the same kind of bills of exchange William Gray was carrying, the same kind of bills of exchange that the Bank of the United States started selling. So Americans had intermittently used bills before the War of 1812, but the changes in the trade accelerated in the late 1810s and 1820s as their ability to uh, draw on credit in London grew. And here's where this kind of opium trade has an interesting wrinkle. Americans gained better access to London bills of exchange because of the cotton boom in the American South. Uh, that's what British factors used to buy uh, American cotton. They often paid for it in British commercial paper, which then China traders could use to make purchases for, uh, uh, to cover their opium and, and tea purchases. So slavery helps expand the opium trade. The opium trade helps expand slavery. It's all part of the same system. Um, the rise of bills of exchange as a medium of exchange at Guangzhou meant that even those who were not directly involved in the opium trade themselves relied on the infrastructure it created. Even Oliphant & Co., a U.S. firm staffed by committed and very zealous evangelicals who very loudly and very often uh, proclaimed their refusal to deal in the drug, um, they still paid for their teas and silks using bills that were made liquid and made valuable by the illicit flow of opium. And so here we have Robert Bennett Forbes, who's a mentee of uh, John Perkins Cushing and not a fan of Oliphant & Co., writing back to his wife, explaining why it's okay he's dealing with opium. He says, everyone trading at Canton, uh, uh, explained to his wife, uh, Robert Bennett Forbes explained to his wife, Rose, depended on bills to get money for purchases. The opium trade affects everyone trading here, right? It's the cash, it's the coin of the realm. <laughs> 
So by the late 1820s, this complex improvised circuit of global commodity exchanges had crystallized into a new system. Americans drank Chinese tea paid for by Southern cotton through the medium of London bills and a Asian opium. So the flourishing of the American China trade after the Napoleonic Wars was, to put it a different way, only possible because of the rapid growth of a capitalist system, a global capitalist system, that depended on black market narcotics, native dispossession, slavery, and confidence in the precarious promises encoded in paper bills. It's a system that eroded state authority over economic policy, both in Asia and in the Americas. Now, in China, American merchants' involvement in the opium trade pushed them into closer collaboration with British traders and into conflict with Qing officials policing that illicit trading, right? So Chinese authorities was drawn to foreign merchants for their violation of smuggling laws, which were crimes. Um, but the prevalence of those crimes and the rise in those crimes convinced uh, uh, imperial officials, not at Guangzhou, but in Beijing, um, convinced imperial administrators that opium import, imports were not just a social problem, but the cause of silver exports that they thought were destabilizing the empire's money supply and thereby weakening the dynasty's authority. So the complica complicating factor here for the Chinese was that the growth of the opium smuggling trade also made the tea trade grow, right? That's what people are exchanging. The tea trade is an important revenue source for the Chinese imperial government. So there's corruption at the local level that ripples backwards and reasons for the imperial government not to crack down. Or when they did crack down, it turned out to be too late. Um, <clears throat> this all came to a head in 1839 with the outbreak of the Opium War, a conflict that began when, the Brit when British forces invaded the China coast in order to force the Qing authorities to pay the cost of opium that local officials had seized as contraband, right? The Opium War is extremely well named. <laughs> it's a war to force the Chinese to pay for opium they had destroyed after they had seized it as contraband. British victory in that war led to a new set of treaties that vastly expanded trading rights for British traders, and that colonial incursion benefited Americans in a couple different ways. First, they acted as neutral parties during the war himself, itself. They made a lot of money um, uh, trading at Guangzhou when, when British uh, shippers could not, but also afterwards when the U.S. government, like other Western powers, rushed in after the war to make similar unequal agreements. Unequal because all the benefits went to Western powers and none of them to the Chinese. And it set the basic terms of U.S.-China relations until the communist takeover in 1949. That new business realities of opium also influenced the trajectory of U.S. politics. When the Bank of the United States came under sustained attack from Jacksonian Democrats in the bank war, uh, about a, 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 a half a decade before, Biddle and his allies pointed repeatedly to the East India bills as proof of the good that the bank had done, that this is a trustworthy institution that does not need any more government oversight. But much to Biddle's surprise, although it, it shouldn't have been that surprising to him, his claims about the amount of control he wielded over the American economy backfired on him, right? Um, George Democrat A.S. Clayton, one of the leading anti-bank leaders in the House of Representatives, seized on the explanation of how the East India Bills replaced specie exports as evidence that there was something delusive in their operation. Worse, the bills, because they were credit, were, quote, dealing without capital, pure speculation that would lead to bank crashes and another reason why this bank should not be trusted without political oversight. So... Uh, to kind of step back a little bit from this, in the aftermath of the War of 1812, Americans increasingly, uh, their increasingly close entanglement with British systems of imperial commerce at Guangzhou formed a new and influential connection between US, the US political economy and global markets, one that complemented deepening ties that were already ongoing because of the boom in cotton. Among the rising generation of practical American politicians, enough glimpsed how integral new traffics of silver, of bills, and of opium were to American fiscal and monetary health to make controlling these flows a public concern. And in this regard, American politicians from Nicholas Biddle to James Buchanan and other Jacksonian Democrats, they paralleled their counterparts among the official class in China, both that they disagreed with each other, but also that they saw these things as a problem. They were all worried that their countrymen's profitable enterprises in Canton were destabilizing the money supply and subverting the state. And like their counterparts in China, Americans were unable to fully account for or control what this system set in motion. In the 1820s and 1830s, American policymakers' attempt to evade the gyres of world trade had the ironic effect of immersing deep Americans more deeply in what one merchant called the troubled waters of speculation. Now, those are depths that drowned a very large number of them, but not everyone. As Thomas H. Perkins, this is the uh, head of Perkins & Company that Johns Perkins Cushing worked for, 
As he advised his business partners when the opium war broke out, crisis could mean opportunity. While the trouble lasts, you will be enabled to do great things. But one such chance happens in a lifetime. Il faut en profiter. One must take advantage. Perkins was speaking from personal experience because he made his first fortune that he later reinvested in the China trade, trading slaves and sugar during the Haitian Revolution in the Caribbean. So he's a guy that knew how to profit from disorder. Now, Perkins sentiment, and, and I'm going to wind this up here, <laughs> Perkins sentiment captures a great deal of how American merchants approached their business in China. But I'm, I'm a little bit loath to give a slave trader turned opium dealer turned philanthropist the last word. So I'm going to say a couple more about what I think this all means uh, and why it matters. What tracking the politics of the China trade demonstrates in this example, as in others, is that the United States has never lived in a vacuum. From the Republic's earliest years, Americans rarely saw themselves as engaged solely in a North American realm or even an Atlantic or a Pacific one. Their frame of reference from the beginning encompassed the entire globe. One of the core ways many early Americans defined themselves and their nation was through their commercial relations, the traffic in goods and people and ideas whose flows bound them to the rest of the world, as well as set them apart and gave them distinct approaches. So the alleged novelty of our current era of you know, late capitalism or globalization sometimes obscures the fact that the world inhabited by folks like Thomas Perkins or Thaddeus Stevens was no less whole, no less round, and no less known to be so than our own. So in Trading Freedom, I argue that understanding the role of global commerce as illustrated by the American trade with China provides a way to back to that early American mode of seeing. And with that vision, I think a deeper understanding of the context and motivations that moved people and what the world had to do with it. And I think engaging with that point of view also provides a useful perspective on what the limits on our present vision of the world and particularly the U.S. relationship with China might be. So as with all history, I hope it promotes a little bit of humility among us all. So yeah, that's my spiel. Thank you very much for your time. And um, I believe we're taking questions from the audience and potentially from Zoom. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna actually ask Dr. Norwood to repeat the questions that I have so that the audience as he can can also hear what it is we are throwing your way. Does anybody want to ask questions? Um, I'm curious in talking, especially about opium, um, what it meant on the consumer end, how American consumers were using opium and who was buying opium. Um, it seems like such an abstract commodity in the way that it moves around the world, but there must have been a, a big market in America for people who were interested in opium and were they rich people and, and how were they using it? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is about um, uh, what's the market for opium in the United States? How were people using it? That kind of thing. Um, so opium in the United States in the same period is not commonly smoked. Smoking opium is something that starts in the 18th century, maybe the 17th century in Southeast Asia. We think in Indonesia, we think with the introduction of tobacco from the Americas. That's we, that's how we, we think it gets started. But that practice doesn't become common in the West for <clears throat> a long time. It never really takes over in the way it does in, in other places. Um, in the Atlantic world and in the United States, opium is eaten, right? Just kind of you know, chomped um, or, um, or, or, or drunk in a concoction known as uh, a tincture known as laudanum, which is opium and alcohol. Um, and that's a very common um, uh, narcotic. And, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's helpful to remember that this is a world where there is not Tylenol, there is not Advil. If you wanted to not feel pain, there was one thing and that's opium, right? Um, and it, it's, you know, it's a very ancient medicine um, known since the Greeks and before. Um, so it's in wide use, as you say, but in the United States, it's often added to patent medicines um, as a form of, of, of laudanum. Um, and um, although it is kind of interestingly gendered, right, there is kind of um, laudanum is, is, is more associated with women and, or abuse of laudanum is more associated in the 19th century with women. Um, later after the civil war, when there's injectables, um, of of opiates, uh, morphine, then later heroin, uh, that becomes that abuse of those narcotics, um, or as the concept of addiction starts to form, which is something that's kind of in motion well into the 20th century, um, that becomes associated with veterans and men who are soldiers suffering war wounds. Um, 
but um, but even the, so, it's it's used medicinally. Um, it's prescribed, but it's also freely available. The United States does not ban the importation or the sale of opium until well into the twentieth century. Um, I hope that it gets at things. Yeah, thank you. Yes, in the back. Zoom, what role did tariffs play in the trade story? That's a great question. Uh, you can see my face light up. So the question from Zoom is, what role did tariffs play in the trade story? So tariffs are, you know, tariff is, is the uh, tax on imported goods into the United States. And the tariff is the critical source of revenue for the United States. It's also um, until income tax in the 20th century. And it is also the main economic policy engine in the United States. If you raise the tariff on certain goods and, uh, uh, it, you know, that are already expensive, you, you can promote domestic industry. If you lower the tariffs on, on other things, you can, you know, pr promote cheaper construct, uh, consumption. It's the, it's the main economic battle that American publics and politicians have for most of the 19th, most of the history of the country until the income tax, right? So in the trade story, what's really interesting about the tariff is that the first tariff that the United States puts together and continuing into the 1820s, that tariff law specifically privileges and promotes American trade with Asia. And it does so in a couple of different ways. Um, it specifically says that goods coming from Asian ports face a much lower duty. They have a much less high, uh, a much lower tax rate. So if you're shipping goods, to, if you're shipping goods in an American ship directly from China to the United States, you pay a third of what someone buying those goods in Europe does um, or bouncing around. Um, it also lowers that lowers uh, that that first tariff and subsequent you know the next twenty five years or so lower tariffs on specific goods cottons from India tea from China so not just things coming from Asian ports but also tariffs on specific categories of goods um, and there's a couple of reasons for that and one is um, this is an economic policy that people in Congress James Madison that first federal commerce uh, Congress uh, very explicitly say, we want to promote American shipping as an, as an industry that's important to national security, that's important to our economic development. Um, if you're an Atlantic power, you want to have a good, what they call the merchant marine, a good commercial fleet, so you don't have to depend on other powers, right? This is the opposite of the situation in the United States today, which is all, entirely dependent on foreign shipping. So they lowered those goods, um, a tariff for American ships to promote that industry, but they also wanted to promote industry uh, direct trade with Asia because they saw it as a way of bypassing Europe and out-competing Europe. Um, it's a bit like kind of building your own airline or launching your own satellites. Um, it's proof, if you, can, if you can have a thriving business with Asia, you've made it as a nation, you've done it. And that's how they, the, the, particularly the first few voyages, you know, get salutes in the harbor and politicians who don't know anything about trade write to their buddies and say, isn't this great? This is really sticking it to the British. It wasn't because they were working with the British, that's business, but whatever. Um, but they, they really take it on as a point of national pride. So trade and the idea of trade with China as a thing that will benefit the United States um, through the tariff, you can see that expressed in concrete political means through the tariff. Thanks very much for the question. Love talking about the tariff. This will seem like a, a self-motivated interest question, but as the stewards of Buchanan some, of course, we always want to know how things Buchanan might play into the picture. And I'm wondering how Buchanan responds to Americans trafficking drugs and presumably um, people, I would imagine migrant laborers um, in China. Yeah, interestingly. Um, so American politicians don't care about Americans uh, uh, trafficking in opium at all. And they and they and Buchanan is among them. And they do so for two reasons. They're unable to um, kind of pretend that it's not happening um, as as part of kind of anti-Britain, British sen sentiment, particularly among Democrats being an Anglophobe is is part of the coin of the realm. And Buchanan is very much participating in that. Um, the difficulty for him is that Americans not only were trafficking in opium, but they were also trafficking in people. And the American officials in China, who after that, after the Opium War, the United States signs a treaty with China after 1844, there is usually an American diplomat on the scene in China, not just other merchants, but actually a U.S. government official, usually a flunky who's like a lower hanging on of whatever administration is riding on. That's you know, some things change in terms of foreign appointments and some things don't. Um, but often it's a political loyalist. So for Buchanan, his political loyalist out there is a guy by the name of William Bradford Reed, who's also pro-Confederate later. 
So very much cut from the same cloth. Um, he writes to Buchanan and says, hey, <laughs> I'm here in China. And you know what Americans are doing is they're indenturing and then illegally shipping Chinese people to go work on plantations. And I think that's a problem because we have an anti-slave trading statute. And also that seems to compete with all these slave owners that we have and that are an important part of your coalition. Indeed, the people that you answer to most directly in Congress. What should I do? The Buchanan administration buries this, um, which is the same thing that that their predecessors had done. Eventually, Reed gets a, a reply back from the um, the Secretary of State who ran it through the AG, and the AG says, ah, you know, we technically have a sl anti-slave trading statute, but for you, don't worry about it. Shut up. Um, and that's the that's the that's the party line on it. That was the party line for administrations before that. Um, depending on who's in power, you know, concern over Chinese migrants who are being mistreated, indentured people who are termed coolies which is not a great term, but that's the that's the, what the trade is called. Um, what's interesting about that is that there's this kind of jujitsu move where slaveholders who are worried about competition for other labor sources, they look at Chinese migrants coming to places in the Americas as replacements for plantations and enslaved people on plantations. And they look at those folks and they worry that that's going to happen to them. And they worry it's going to happen in places they want to expand, particularly Cuba. And so there becomes this anti antebellum uh, slaveholder rhetoric of, uh, our abolitionist enemies are actually human traffickers who are trafficking in white people to Cuba. So they, they racialize the Chinese as white. They define them as being enslaved, even though they're in a different form of bondage. And they raise a whole a lot of uh, uh, hell about it. Um, and that's why Buchanan's appointees are worried about it, right? Um, the jujitsu move here is that anti-slavery people and abolitionists come to say, yeah, actually, this trade is like slavery. This is terrible. What happens coming out of the Civil War is that that opprobrium of being trafficked sticks to all Chinese people. So the rhetoric of decrying the Chinese as people who cannot become citizens, people who are racially other, you know, it gets folded into a white supremacy that is also an anti-Blackness, right? So it's this weird thing where the Chinese get defined as white by slaveholders, but because they get defined as being enslaved, no matter how they're moving throughout the world, the people who come to California are not trafficked in that way. Um, they're defined as being enslaved and unworthy of citizenship, thus they should be excluded. So there's this really kind of interesting like turnabout that Buchanan is a key cog in that machine. But yeah, he doesn't care what they're doing um, unless it's a, a thumb he can put in the eye of uh, whatever British uh, foreign representative he's talking with. Sorry, that was a really long answer. That's a great answer, thank you. Any final questions? Best ignorance about this. Um, during the time span that you are looking at, was trade between America and Japan something that was combative or problematic with our trade with China as well? Oh, that's a really good question. So the question is, was during the same time period, was trade with Japan combative? Did it, in, it you know, it, in, in, interact with trade with China in the same way? That's a really good question. Um, in, in some ways, the trade with China is what sparks the efforts to open Japan, right? Um, there's some really early efforts that before Perry where China merchants and evangelicals try to sail into Japan's harbor and, um, you know, they do it with a, a Commodore uh, uh, who who does not does not become famous because he gets punched and pushed back onto his boat. And then Perry shows up with a bunch of guns a couple of years later, and then that's a different conversation. Um, but throughout the 19th century, the trade with Japan it remains at pretty low levels. The kind of interactions between China and in the United States is really about how does the, the Japanese state react to westernization and opening up. And um, they want to avoid, the Japanese look at what's happening to China and want to avoid it. And so they want to adopt technologies. They want to change. There's more incentive to change government systems and take on, a lot of Americans become um, kind of experts that are helping the Meiji kind of redesign things because they look at what happened in China, which the Opium War, you know, there's the first Opium War, the second Opium War, uh, the British and the French, and sometimes the Americans are also there kind of cheering them on, are continually invading China and, and demanding new trading concessions and, and biting away Chinese sovereignty. And the Japanese look at that and say, not for us. Um, and they they succeed in, in keeping that distant. In terms of trade, eventually Japan's 
tea trade overtakes American trade with tea in China, but it's that's a late 19th century and early 20th century thing. And it has to do with kind of Americans' taste in tea, which um, is green. Americans like green tea and not not the not the harder stuff, um, um, in part because when they first get into the trade, it's cheaper. Um, but the Japanese become really good at making an export product uh, for tea. But there's not, in terms of interacting, there is a lot of the same people are investing in China ventures as they are in Japanese ventures, but the takeoff point, you know, the China trade kind of peaks in the 1870s, 1880s. It keeps growing, but not as fast. And trade with Japan takes off at the same, a little bit later. So it becomes more important um, as just a, as a business. Um, but it's a lot of the same investors. Yeah. Thank you. One last question. Another question from Zoom. Where do you think the future of US China trade is headed? So the question from Zoom is asking a historian a terrible thing, and that's to predict the future. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, there's a lot of um the the history I describe. You know, I came to this project as an American historian, not as a, a specialist in China. I've picked up some knowledge of China in the way. A lot has changed in China um, since, um, you know, a lot of changes in the United States as well. It's easier for me to say the, see the things in the United States that are continuities. And one of the things that is a continuity is that how Americans approach their relationship with China has a lot to do with what they think it can do for them domestically in their politics. Right. So contemporary ideas about protectionism or lost jobs or, um, you know, various forms of white supremacy towards um, Asian folks. That's a lot about domestic American politics and always has been. And I think what's useful about this history is that it makes it really visible. Right. Um, I also think what it makes visible is, is that there is a past, a long past, where Americans regarded their relationship with China as something that could be mutually beneficial. Um, and that free commerce and open communication was something that they could offer the Chinese that other powers could not. Um, and that was America's special sauce for a while. Uh, there's a moment in Reconstruction where Americans are really putting together a, a, what, what their representative calls a cooperative policy that really has the promise, as Reconstruction did, to really reshape racial relations, but also economic relations. And it falls apart. Um, and that is a moment of loss, I think. So I don't know what the future holds. I can say, though, that if it follows on the track of the past where, um, you know, ideas about white supremacy and ideas about, you know, keeping things locked down and controlled for a specific interest benefit overwhelm, then that seems like a continuity with the 20th century rather than the 19th or the 18th. Did I dodge it enough? I don't know. <laughs> Two areas. One, <clears throat> how would you describe uh, how safe uh, trade with China was? In other words, uh, we know a lot of the uh, trade merchants would ship um, a load and they split it amongst two or three ships, anticipating. You know, problem either interdiction or bad weather. <laughs> That's one thing. And um, the other is um, you address fishing, the fishing trade with China. You know, at one point here, the um, one recent uh, book where people in Gloucester were more accustomed to meeting neighbors in China than they were. Back in Massachusetts, because mm -hmm. everybody was in C. Yeah, uh, I'm gl always glad to hear Glosser brought up. Um, <laughs> I'm from Massachusetts originally. I've hidden it well in my accent. But um, so yeah, so the question of safety. Yeah, I mean, shipping is just terribly dangerous, right? And it and it and it is in the 18th century and is in the 19th century. In terms of you know financial safety, these guys were really good. The successful among them, I should say, were really good at. Um, ensuring themselves, distributing, as you said, cargoes between different ships, not putting all the eggs into one basket, having your trustworthy nephew go out and manage your China affairs, that kind of thing. These are all, a lot of the structure of American trade with China is about financial safety, is about being aware of the dangers of the sea, um, which sometimes on the China coast could in involve piracy um, at various points. It's never as, you know, it's never as, you know, they never go full Johnny Depp. It's never, 
um, <clears throat> uh, 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 you know, Pirates of the Caribbean stuff. But um, but piracy is a concern, but also just dangerous. These are dangerous routes. And that's partly why it paid so well, right? That's partly why it was such a profitable and high status trade is that to be able to go and come back and sail around Cape Horn, you know, that's crazy. That's or or spend time clubbing seals to gather furs. That's nuts. That's that's a dangerous occupation. But it's also dangerous on board the ships because of the labor conditions and social conditions. So um, in the in the indentured Chinese migrant trade, um, a lot of those ships become famous as disasters at sea because of mutinies, because of mass suicides, and because they're killing people in the holds by suffocating them. Um, and those that, that that really captivates the American press for a while about the dangers of shipping people um, or dangers of just mistreating your sailors and they mutiny against you. That's a that's a constant danger. Um, Part of what's interesting about the kind of slow extension of American governmental authority to China is that, you know, before there's a diplomat in place, there's consuls. Consuls technically have authority over sailors who've gone rogue. They can jail them. They're also supposed to take care of their hospital bills. And their constant work is dealing with guys who jump ship or beat up the shipmaster or just wanted to leave. And that like everyday violence of of the maritime trade is really, I think, that um, sometimes from that the kind of view I've given here, which is kind of a, a bird's eye view, that like everyday violence of life on these ships is really not present, but it's a very violent life, um, even if the cargo itself is somewhat safe. Um, in terms of people meeting people abroad, yeah, I mean, you know, fishing is not as big of a deal in this period, although there are later moments where where fishing or the whale fishery is is a big deal um, in the Pacific. And builds on a lot of these China trading routes, like Hawaii is first a stopover point, or the Sandwich Islands is first a stopover point for um, China traders, and then it becomes a stopover point for whalers. Um, and that's also an incredibly dangerous um, uh, uh, profession. Um, although, again, the way that these businesses are structured is they often offload the danger and the risk to the laborers rather than the finance guys, right? Um, you don't succeed in business by... Uh, uh, by losing, by by it mattering if a bunch of guys die in your whaling vessel, um, so so yeah, I, I, the the point about safety is really well taken. Um, I, I will also say once once they shift to steamboats, steamboats also blow up all the time. So there's that aspect of it too. So even if you're not hitting icebergs, you might just explode. So yeah, very dangerous time and and uh, very that's part of why the premium on these goods is so high. And why the prestige of being a, a guy who's gone around and commanded a ship um, is such a, you know, people people lead a couple of China trading voyages and they go around being called captain or commodore for the rest of their lives. Um, and it's because it's a high prestige thing um, that prestige over facing danger. So, um, yeah, thanks very much for the question.